Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today, I am here with Denim God, and we're going to be talking about an interesting topic called Capital as Power, a theory that goes by the term, by the abbreviation CAST, Capital as Power. It is a theory I've been very fascinated with recently that I am yet to fully delve into, but just looking on a video, which I will include a segment of in this podcast, called Can Capitalists Afford Economic Growth by the channel called Preorder, which essentially gives a little summary of what CASP, Capital as Power, is. And something I'm very interested in because I'm always here on the One Dime Radio channel to explore various theories that can complement an analysis with Marxism, such as modern monetary theory. And I see CASP as something that fills a certain void in theory that I don't see other theories Phil. And just to give a little background as to what Capital as Power is, it's popularized by the book Capital as Power, A Study of Order and Pre-Order by Jonathan Nitzen. And yeah, it's a theory that's not that widely known, but it's been making its way into political economy circles. It's very interesting. So why don't we just get straight into it? Denim God, what is CASP? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get it more specific as we uh, we go on. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on, uh, One Dime. Appreciate it. I'll always love the opportunity to talk oh. about CASP. And one thing, I, I have to give credit to A World to Win, Melody from A World to Win, who was on this podcast for the episode on liberalism, a counter history, for introducing me to Denim God and finding me someone good to talk about CASP with. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah shout out to World to Win. She's the best. Go subscribe. But uh, yes, for uh, capital is power. It is a uh, it's a new, very new, published in two thousand nine, uh, holistic political economic theory that p- proposes that instead of capital being you know a pile of utility per neoclassical economics or a uh, pile of uh, congealed labor time. Uh, per uh, Marxist political economy, it's rather a symbolic pseudo quantification of a capital holder's power over the uh, holistic socioeconomic reproductive machine as a whole. Uh, And power to what? The power to sabotage it. Uh, And we'll get into uh, sabotage later. But overall, CASP is a a new kind of a, a third anarcho holistic political economic model that poses itself against neoclassical economics and marxist economics is the is it anarchist uh because i i looked into the background of jonathan itson and it doesn't seem to be an anarchist but i have seen it circulated in anarchist circles yeah that's basically uh how it's going uh nitson has uh, an interesting background in both the libertarian socialists and I believe uh, a little bit of Trotskyist uh, movements, um, but or rather literature. Uh, but what where where the theory is really gaining ground right now is within anarchist elements um, applying capitalist power to anarchist theory and praxis. I can sort of see maybe why anarchists would be interested in it because it shifts the emphasis away from profits per se you know maximizing utility to power which in a way go fits in line with the anarchist uh, emphasis on hierarchy right as opposed to merely class which i think makes sense uh in what way when you, when you say uh it's a shift of power as opposed to utility maybe it Maybe delve into that a little bit first, because that is something that I think people who might not be familiar with political economy might not understand. For sure, for sure. So the capitalist power model is kind of, uh, oh, I'll I'll give a little background on um, neoclassical uh, and and Marxist uh, political economy before I get into Cass a little bit. So for for people who aren't familiar, Neoclassical uh, economics, which is you know the economics that gets taught in colleges and is, is viewed as mainstream economics, uh, it, it views capital as a collection of utility. 
um, where the kind of the narrative that uh, they're spinning is that, you know, if you take your money and you save it and you don't buy avocado toast, then the amount of money that you save is going to be equal to the amount of utility that you could have got from spending that money on avocado toast. And then you take that money and you buy a factory with it instead. And the factory, the, the money that you use to buy the factory, it represents the same amount of utility as all of that money that you could have spent on avocado toast. And I'm being very, uh, I'm, I'm oversimplifying and being very reductive, but it, it essentially sees capital as a large quantity of saved utility, which then creates more utility. You know, factories make more utility, so on and so forth. Uh, Marxist economics, in contrast, puts the emphasis on uh, labor and uh, labor value. So instead of seeing capital as a big hunk of utility, it sees it as a big hunk of dead labor. Um, and again, I'm going to be very, very reductive here, but uh, essentially a, a machine to uh, a Marxist economist represents the sum of the uh, labor hours and the skill that it took to make that machine. And then over the course of its life, the machine imbues the products that, ma that it makes with that labor time. Um, and then that uh, goes on to a... Uh, uh, an, an, an economy wide scale as well, uh, where capital itself represents uh, essentially congealed labor time as a whole, um, where, which capital owners have taken away from the workers that have produced it. Uh, which is, you know, and, and, you know, Nitzan and Bickler of the caste model, they uh, give Marx a whole lot of credit, you know, for his uh, revolutionary thought. They're definitely, you know, very, uh, very committed anti-capitalists, um, but they have a lot of criticisms of that conception of political economy. So the caste model in uh, contradiction to the neoclassical and the Marxist frameworks sees power not as a, or rather sees capital not as a material economic quantity, but rather as a power, uh, a, a, a holistic power that is only pseudo quantified. So instead of the stock market value of a corporation, what do you mean by pseudo quantified? Pseudo quantified in that you can't ever derive the real quantity. So with neoclassical and Marxist economics, okay. you can both theoretically, you know, count the number of avocado toasts that you could have bought that are equal to a factory, or you could count the number of labor hours required to make uh, you know, the socially necessary average labor hours that are required to make the machines and the building and you know, the fixed capital of the factory. But Cass proposes that because fundamentally what capital is representing, the numbers on the stock market and capitalization, what that represents isn't a, a physical material asset, but rather power. There's never a real quantity that you can observe or derive capital from. It's really just the sum of everyone you know, in a marketplace setting estimating what the relative power of that owner of capital is relative to other owners. I think um, maybe one thing that could uh, be used as an example, sort of what you're saying that are that might help with the listener understand it is in the video I, I referred to, which I showed a clip of in the start of this podcast is in, in can capitalists afford economic growth. Um, the theory of CASP seems to put an emphasis on differential power, uh, meaning that like, for example, there, there's some there, there is an inconsistency in political economy that can't, doesn't seem to be really explained by any of the dominant theories, whether it be uh, neoclassical economics, Keynesian economics, or Marxist economics. And that is, how come when there's lower economic growth, capitalists seem to actually be better off? Which is very, con which is very, which contradicts with the idea that everybody wants economic growth. And pretty much all sides of the political spectrum are sort of geared to think this way. Marxists and all leftists really, for the most part, tend to think, including myself really, um, that capitalism is obsessed with economic growth. But if we actually look at the last 40 years, um, well, really actually since the 1950s, but 
more 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 so during the when neoliberalism started more so since the 70s uh economic growth has really dwindled but you see the share of, if you see like the overall profits are actually going down the share of overall income that the capitalists have is much larger that's the thing the video is pointing out and that's something that's what's why i got in, why i'm interested in in cast because this seems to contradict a lot with Marx's notions of the falling rate of profit, which we can get further into after, um, because that's often used to explain the cause of all crises. But if you look at like the capitalists seem to be doing just fine, and the capitalists, weirdly enough, seem to be advocating for policies that do not increase economic growth. They're advocating for austerity, which is bizarre, because why would you want to balance budgets that would reduce private sector surpluses? That would literally reduce profits. It would reduce income purchasing power and profits. Why would they advocate for these low growth policies? It doesn't seem to be explained by either a Marxist framework or especially not a neoclassical framework, which would kind of assume that, you know, when growth goes up, we all do better. So we shouldn't we all want it? So in what way does caste fill this void? And how does it tie into what you're explaining about power? Sure. So the... One of the main points of caste, as you said, uh, was that um, uh, was that caste uh, states and argues very hard and has a great empirical backing for the resting point of capitalism is stagflation. Um, because well, you know, when we think about it, economic growth challenges the uh, the power uh, institutions. Um, that are current that currently have uh, social and economic power uh, in capitalism. You know, if we think about uh, you know the the transition from feudal uh, and medieval modes of production to capitalism, you know, the economic growth that was uh, being experienced in the industrial revolution was very very threatening to the entrenched power structure of that society, and it ultimately overtook and overthrew it. Um, Casp, uh, you know, and, and and intuitively, you know, we see just as economic growth threatened the kings and queens of old, economic growth also uh, also threatens the capitalists because uh, growth is inherently conflictual. You know, you grow relative to someone else. Um, you know, think of it like this. You know, for uh, capitalists, they don't really care what the objective uh amount of uh return they have is you know i tell you that exxon mobile made a billion dollars last year uh capitalists are like oh okay so what what does that mean in order for that to have any reference you need to and in order for that to have any meaning it needs to be expressed relative to another capital entity so if i tell you that exxon mobile made a billion dollars whereas you know bp made two billion you go oh that's terrible i'm going to disinvest in exxon mobile and go invest in bp and you know that's and, and rather that's uh, how the process of benchmarking uh works uh where a capitalist will look at the average returns or the average benchmark for an industry but to understand why stagflation is you know the the norm the resting point for capitalism instead of growth? Um, we have to understand of uh, Thorsten Veblen's concept of business and industry, which is one of the cornerstones of the caste model. Where you know back in the nineteen twenties and thirties, Veblen uh, Veblen thought that business and industry are two separate entities, and when you think about it, it's very intuitive. Um, where business its goal is to make profit. And business is ultimately a legal entity. It's a, it's a power entity that would not exist without uh, the state and without uh, an institution of power. Um, whereas industry has happened for you know, as long as humans have been producing anything, not only since the Industrial Revolution, but you know, since we've been farming, the Agricultural Revolution. Uh, it's industry is just the process by which people produce and consume the things that they want and need. Um, so when we think about the separation between business and industry, we can say, okay, the factories that uh, that General Motors uses to make cars, 
uh, are going to remain whether or not there is a General Motors or not. You know, if GM goes bankrupt, then the factories could get bought by Ford and now they're part of Ford, or they could be seized by the workers and, you know, used by the workers to make cars. Uh, but the, the industry, the factories remain. Business, if the business didn't have those factories, then it couldn't exist. You know, GM cannot exist without and cannot profit without the ability to make cars. So business and industry are inherently separate entities where the goal of industry is to produce the things that people want and need. And the goal of business is to profit. So how do businesses profit uh, by controlling the production of things that people want and need? Well, you can't profit off of something that is abundant, you know, like just how, you know, the joke in the Lorax is, you know, the richest guy is O'Hare, the man who figured out how to sell air, you know, the only reason why uh, anyone can profit from uh, something in a system of exchange is because it's scarce. But the thing is, is that the industrial revolution and also the digital revolution have ushered in an, you know, uh, truly an, an era of abundance uh, in terms of what could be produced. You know, I think insulin is a really good example uh, to look at here where, you know, the, the capacity that the world has, or really any nation has to produce insulin uh, far exceeds any possible demand because insulin is very cheap to produce. It's very easy to produce. We've known how to make it for, you know, uh, half a century longer. Uh, and, and we have the facilities to do so, but the price of insulin is kept up through artificial limitation of that, uh, of that product by business. Um, so we have our in internet, the internet, like internet, uh, intellectual property also, but also internet infrastructures. An example, it's not doesn't cost that much to maintain in the internet, yet you have monopolies who will really raise prices as high as they possibly can. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So absolutely. It's like ma making making things that are naturally abundant scarce artificially, artificial Pre scarcity. Precisely. Uh, and and uh, Nitsin and Bickler call this the business, and Bevelin does as well, they call this the business sabotage of industry, which is the root of profit to them. So there's just countless examples, you know, like patents restricting people from using physical property or, you know, a, a process or a physical concept, water, air, and land rights, restricting people from the commons, you know, uh, restricting production in a classical sense, destroying already produced goods, which, you know, Several several corporations have gone into hot water, such as uh, Amazon and Walmart, destroy hundreds of thousands of items every day in order to, you know, create scarcity, keep the price up. Um, planned obsolescence, planned incompatibility. I'll get into some examples of all these in a minute, but you know, the idea is that we live in an era of industrial abundance. In order to prevent a, a, a continuous crisis of overproduction, capital creates artificial scarcity. And there are two ways that capital can grow under this paradigm. Either it can expand itself to new uh, processes and new nations, new markets that it hasn't entered before, or it can double down on those markets that it already uh, that it already has control of, and extract more and more from them. And it's in Bickler call this uh, breadth versus depth, and uh, they explain the business cycle as an alternation between breadth regimes of growth and depth regimes of growth. So, and and this is not economic growth, but growth of capitalist profits because depth regimes are stagflation. They don't have any economic growth. They're all growing profits while stagnating the overall economy. So. How breadth works, you know, a good example of breadth, I think, would be uh, two examples would be number one, the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, 
uh, letting neoliberal capitalism run rampant uh, throughout Russia and its expansion right. at the same time into uh, Asia, you know, uh, where there used to be more focus on a peasant economy, uh, but then you got uh, more involvement in global trade as transportation costs went down. So you had capital expanding to new markets uh, at that time. Um, and this was during the 1990s, and the 1990s was probably the last period of prolonged, you know, smooth sailing economic growth that we've seen. And this was a breadth regime. Capital didn't really need to fight each capital entities didn't need to fight each other or fight internal to the markets that they uh, already uh, controlled because they were, you know, growing by leaps and bounds in markets that they had previously been excluded from, you know, they're, they're growing in terms of breadth, but then they ran out of space. You know, they, they ran out of innovation from, you know, the, the tech boom and they, they ran out of new places for the market to expand. So in order to keep profits rising and keep capitalization rising, they have to turn to depth and crack down on those markets that they already control and squeeze more blood out of a rock. And how they do that is through inflation. And this is a very, very important part of the capitalist power model, where both Marxists and neoclassicals, they insist that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. You know, Marxists along the lines of fictitious capital and uh, neoclassical is along the lines of uh, well, Friedman's. I should I should just because uh, I know Marxists, I have, a lot, I have a lot of Marxists who listen to this podcast, so I, I'm going to play the devil's advocate for a bit uh, while you're pitching this theory, but for with the Marxist theory of inflation, I mean, some would say that, yeah, like debasing the currency, they might have like a silly neoclassical understanding of inflation. I have more of a MMT understanding of inflation, but I think, you know, some Marxists who are, I th would, would say it's the price setters and MMT people would say that too. It's price setters trying to maximize profit. That is kind of like the main root of inflation. You know, when there's like an, an excess, enough demand to the point where capitalists can get away with raising prices as much as possible. And yeah. 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 Precisely. Well, let's think about the implications of that for a moment, because I like MMT, but they don't go far enough. I think, you know, if, if we think, because I, I think we're led to capitalist power if we think about the inflation question for a minute. So walking through it, um, we, you know, inflation as Hall and Hitch in 1939 and Blender in 1998 uh, both demonstrated is usually led by, as you said, uh, by large corporations trying to profit maximize. Um, but then you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, they, they're, they're on the leading edge of that trend, but then it goes away as uh, other uh, entities raise prices to keep up with uh, those large corporations on the bleeding edge of uh, raising prices. But remembering about inflation, that inflation does not happen uniformly. You know, we, we see this number of headline inflation, 8.5%, you know, 7.9%. And we think, you know, it kind of uh, induces us to think of inflation as everything has gone up by 8.5% or 7.9%. Uh, but rather, uh, it's more that, you know, Corn has gone up by 3%, flour has gone up by 6%, and gas has gone up by 20%. And then they average those and weight them out, uh, you know, the both CPI and PCE yeah. to get a different index of inflation. But what that means that often isn't talked about is that inflation is not a monetary phenomenon then. It's a redistributional phenomenon because both profit, income, and capital, all three, are redistributed from those that are not able to raise their prices as fast as uh, those who are able to raise them much faster. So essentially, capital, uh, income, and societal power are redistributed from uh, and capital entities that couldn't raise their prices fast enough to capital entities that could successfully raise their prices relative to other prices. And what that means is that inflation is not a monetary phenomenon, but rather it's a redistributional phenomenon when it occurs. And whoever raises their prices first is redistributing not only uh, you know, short-term profits, but also long-term capital allocation. And what that means uh, in the context of today and Kassenstagflation is that 
corporations use inflation as a tool of redistribution, not only corporations, but also the Federal Reserve um, as it uh, uh, as it's controlled by the large banks. It's not actually a Democrat, uh, even a pseudo democratic government entity. Um, so how it works is in these debt regimes, corporations go, well, I can't increase my profits anymore by expanding to new markets. I'm going to have to increase my profits by squeezing more blood out of the markets I have. I'm going to start to raise prices. And then we get a redistribution away, you know, over the course of a decade or more, uh, away from uh, small capital holders that don't have the social power to force people to pay their higher prices, you know, uh, two capital holders that are larger and do have the power to monopolize or oligopolize a market and force people to pay those higher prices. Uh, and that results in larger relative capitalization for the large entities relative to the small entities and making them more successful uh, under capitalism with higher market capitalizations. And I'll, I'll talk in a second about how the Federal Reserve plays in with uh, quantitative easing. But... Um Oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's a that's a whole other thing we we can get into. But I, I do want to push back a bit. Is I think all your all what you're saying is true, and I I think it, it it's pretty accurate in terms of really, um, well, inflation is certainly not a monetary phenomenon. I mean, just kn knowing MMT, knowing just the contradictions of of um of like what. The quantitative theory of money says and what actually happens, you know, uh, it, it's clearly easily disprovable. But the, the the idea of inflation being a sort of in phenomenon that does actually benefit the rich, uh, well, not all inflation, because right there's there's some like wage spike inflation that capitalists don't like uh, or purport to not like. But th what you're saying is something I'm already seeing many leftists saying, both Marxists and MMT people, is uh, if you've seen the meme going around that um, it says capitalists are complaining about inflation, but at the same time, they're like, you know, like getting much higher profits. And you see like, oh, what a coincidence that inflation is at all time high and so are uh, corporate profits. Right, right. Right. And um, so... Yeah, in what ways is this unique to Casp? Like, in what way? In what way does Casp really carve a unique? In what way does Casp bring a unique contribution to inflation? Oh, well, I think it's because it's observing the reality and taking it to its logical implications. Because you know, as as you're saying, a lot of leftists are seeing this, and um, and you know, the the correlation between inflation and redistribution, and uh, they're like, you know, yeah, you know, we do see uh, inflation uh, along with surging corporate profits, uh, but then they don't think about well, that there is an empirical demonstration that prices don't track labor values. And then that makes it very, very hard to have a Marxist understanding of market price uh, when you admit that inflation isn't a, uh, a monetary phenomenon, but is a redistributional one. And then say, okay, well, how do we square the circle of, you know, market prices are supposed to be over the long run commensurate with uh, the socially necessary abstract labor time required to produce that commodity. Um, and yet we have the long-term price of the commodity not being dependent on that labor value, but rather on the power ability of corporations to raise price. So it's the implication that by recognizing that inflation is redistributional, uh, we can't describe price fluctuations even in the long term with uh, the labor theory of value anymore that I think uh. Cass brings to the table. I got to push back on that too, because this, the idea that Marxists think prices are determined by labor values is often used as like a straw man, especially by um, Austrian economists to attack Marxism when that's most Marxists acknowledge that prices do not often reflect labor values. Like even in wage labor and capital, uh, Marx talks about how prices are more determined by supply and demand. And that labor more is just an input, right, which can affect the price, but it's ultimately the supply and demand, the market value that determines it. Um, 
Oh and, yes, yes, absolutely. and if we and if we take this to its conclusion, right, we can even you say like, okay, so supply and demand, and th then by that logic, the suppliers can also determine the price. So let's say there's no price controls on a certain good and there's a high demand for it. The price setters, the capitalists will raise prices. Is this not still, com is this not still, does this not still work within a Marxist framework? No, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting a little close in terms of verbiage to that argument, but no, that's that's a straw man. I'm not trying to make that argument. Um, what I am trying to say is in the long, you know, as Mar you know, Marx readily admits that short-term prices, uh, you know, ex exchange values are, you know, determined by uh, supply and or largely determined by supply and demand. What I'm saying is that over the long run of, you know, 80, 90, 100 years, capitalization itself, the price of capital is dependent on power relations, not labor values. And uh, Nitzan and Bickler make a very, very strong empirical case uh, for this. Uh, in capitalist power, where they have two really crown jewels of uh, evidence for this, um, where they plot the current cost. Number one, they plot the current costs of corporate fixed assets. You know the change in you know the book value of uh, assets over time, and then they plot the market value of the corporations that hold those book assets, and. What we should see, according to a you know a labor theory of value understood uh, uh, capitalization framework, what we should see is that the the value of the fixed assets should track the the market value of the corporation, vice versa. More machines, more fixed capital, higher market value, and instead we see the exact opposite that the market value of a corporation moves inversely to the current cost of its fixed assets. And you go- well, True, and that's fascinating to me, actually. Um, and also what's weird is that another trend you see is stock asset prices, well, mainly the stock market, uh, asset prices in the stock market, the value of stock seems to actually be inversed with the overall profits and economic growth of that company, of that yeah, country. Yeah. So like, for example, like I saw this thing that's fascinating is like when, when overall growth is high stock, the, the growth of asset prices is actually lower versus, and I mean, specifically, I'm not sure about if you count real estate into this, but I'm more referring to like the stock market because this is, I think I'm out of all places, I see an argument made by stock investors because um, I remember I was always I was really back when I was really interested in like whether China was like truly like capitalist. I was looking into like China's stock market because to me that's like one of the easiest ways to tell if a country is like actually like state capitalist or or if it's just you know uh, has capitalistic elements but is not fully capitalist. And a lot of investors they suggested against investing in China and Vietnam because they have high rates of economic growth, which are historically correlated in the opposite. They're negatively correlated with growth, which is very confusing because you'd think, wouldn't a growing economy, you'd want to invest in the companies because it's growing, but it's actually the opposite. And that's where CASP is interesting to me because what theory even accounts for this? It's, it seems like such a glaring contradiction that I haven't seen explained by really any theory. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's what we're getting at with the stagflation as a resting point, you know. Um, and and the uh, other uh, you know uh, crown jewel of their evidence, I think you know it goes really really well with this, is that uh, Nitzan and Bickler make a very very simple comparison between Tobin's Q and a buy to build indicator. So what that is, is Tobin's Q is the ratio of the market value of stocks and bonds to the current cost of fixed assets. And you can think of that as uh, essentially a ratio, a ratio between how much uh, the corporation is capitalized on uh, the, the free market, quote unquote free market, uh, and uh, how much they actually own. So just what we were talking about uh, before that trend uh, with uh, fixed assets and market equity uh, going inverse to each other. Um, so, so think of Tobin's Q as 
a uh, ratio of how overpriced a corporation is. You know, where if Tobin's Q is very high, then the capitalization is very high to a corporation's fixed assets. If Tobin's Q is low, then the capitalization is very low uh, to a corporation's fixed assets. And they do a buy to build indicator, which is mergers and acquisitions as a percent of gross fixed capital formation, which is essentially, well, how measuring how much corporations are merging and acquiring each other versus how much they're just investing in new capital. So it's essentially, you know, whether or not they're going to buy capital or build it. Uh, and what you would expect uh, in you know, both neoclassical and Marxist frameworks is that uh, these indices would move opposite to each other, you know, where capitalists would buy capital when it's cheap to buy capital. You see more mergers and acquisitions when the stock market's low and corporations are cheap to buy. Uh, and you'd see capitalists building capital and you know expanding their own fixed assets when it's cheap to uh, build capital and it's expensive to buy. You know who wants to buy you know a, a corporation when it's at you know a peak stock market value? You want to wait until it drops so that you don't spend as much. Uh, and actually, we see these indicators track each other to a T. The correlation is startling. You go, wait a minute, what does that mean? It means that capitalists are buying corporations when it's expensive to buy them and building uh, capital when it's expensive to build capital. What are they doing? And the answer is, is that they know that if you build too much capital, then you're going to cause a crisis of uh, of, of overproduction. And they are pre-ordering the process of production to make sure that a crisis of overproduction never happens. So you see mergers and acquisitions happening more and more and more, even as stock market values get higher and higher and higher, uh, because capitalists refuse to expand uh, through building new factories and farms and equipment uh, because they want to restrict the amount of commodities available. And thus, by restricting the amount of commodities available, they can jack up prices to whatever because people got to eat. And there's your inflation and there's your stagflation as the norm. So curious how this ties into automation because what's always been interesting to me is how you typically see automation is accelerates the most in periods of high economic growth, not low economic growth. Um, like for instance, we often think that automation is accelerating the fastest now. And while it's still happening, really automation now is much at a, it's happening at a much slower pace than it was in the 1960s, which is when um, automation took off the most. I mean, it obviously took off really a lot during the industrial revolution, but it took off also significantly in the post-World War II period. Uh, peaking around the 1960s. And that's interesting because it's n you obviously see that th the capitalists, if, if there's larger economic growth, they're not turning to automation precisely as a to compensate for the lack of workers. Because there's often this idea that, um, oh, you, they build robots, that, or sorry, they uh, you know invest in machinery when there is not enough labor there, right? And, and um, Automation is a form of capital, right? That adds to their overall profits um, in the long run. But you tend to see um, a greater investment in automation as the economy grows, as wages rise, and you see a decline in investment on automation as the economy stagnates and as the um, and as and uh, as wages stagnate now the marxists are going to be pointing out but this is already explained by the falling rate of profit uh, because in the falling rate of profit for those who don't know the tendency of the rate of profit to fall basically when you have lower you know less purchasing power and then you have less profits made there's a there's a rate of profit which is not the same thing as the profit itself so in a, an enterprise might be growing fast, right? But evident at some point, inevitably, there'll be a declining rate of that profit. It'll grow at a less faster rate. And what happens then is then you start to have less investment investors invest in that company. They start to pull out. And this kind of creates a cycle where there's, you know, fa falling rate of profit and also less capital investment, et cetera. And typically, um, 
also as wages get more expensive, it incentivizes, um, sorry, as uh, wages get more expensive, as the economy grows, capitalists will invest in machinery, which might help them at a certain point, but also creates a contradiction of lowering the rate of profit because this creates less variable capital, meaning that like, let's say their profit reduces, they can't merely lower their wages. You can't do that to machines, right? So this, Marxists would say this is the phenomenon of automation is very explainable by the falling rate of profit. I'm curious, what does CASP have a, a perspective that is different on automation? Because automation yeah. obviously ties a lot into what we're talking about with you know enterprises and growth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe the, the the CASP perspective on automation really starts with a rejection of the idea that the rate of profit is falling. Um, because the way that uh, Marxist studies typically operate, and, and allow me to uh, quote my man here at the New School, uh, Duncan Foley. Um, where is, where did I put this? Oh, yes. Uh, so Nitz and Bickler uh, respond to Foley directly uh, in Capital is Power. But Foley says uh, in his paper, Recent Developments in the Labor Theory of Value, uh, first published in 1997 and then republished in 2000, he says, quote, uh, given the wide availability of market price accounting data in financial and government sources and the expense, difficulty, and possible error involved in reconstructing embodied labor coefficients for many periods and economies from input-output tables, here's the important part, most empirical work will use market price data as a first approximation to an embodied labor coefficient system of accounts. And essentially what Foley is saying right there is you know, in order to measure labor values and value extraction and the rate of profit, we're using prices. But those theories, labor value and the falling rate of profit, are supposed to explain those prices in the first place. So the methodology of uh, recent developments in the labor theory of value and of Duncan Foley's own work is circular in that he's trying to use prices in order to explain uh uh, fluctuations in uh, labor values and profit, but labor values and the falling rate of profit are, are used to explain those prices themselves. Uh, so CASP critiques Foley and critiques uh, uh, new interpretationists uh, for such methodology and says, you know, and puts forward a compelling argument that actually the rate of profit isn't falling uh, very much at all. The rate of profit is remaining uh, stagnant. And that the uh, the process of automation isn't so much about uh, producing uh, more for less as much as it is about power and control. In that you're just reducing the risk of unionization <laughs> by uh, increasing automation more than you are squeezing more profit out of production. Now, this is also another question I had because in the video. Um, that I referred to about economic growth that sort of aims to summarize CASP. One of the things is that capitalists, what they want ultimately more is power as opposed to just merely maximizing profit. And among many things, they talk about how capitalists will aim to have as much power over their employees as possible and relative shares of income compared to other capitalists and compared to also workers. Um, when while you have a decline of wages during slow periods of economic growth, and even sometimes a decline of profits, capitalists actually benefit because they have more power over their employee and more a higher share of income, even though that overall growth has declined. Now, Marxists would chime in and say, because you know, I have to play the devil's advocate because um of course, of course. I, I, go, I, I go to school with all the devil's advocates. <laughs> yeah. So the, what the Marxists will say, well, the Marxists explain this phenomena of power uh, between the power relationship between employers and employees through what Marx called the reserve army of labor, right? Is that Mar Marx writes about how capitalists and, the, well, and the, with the help of the capitalist state, obviously, will intentionally want and maintain a reserve army of labor, which is a pool of unemployed people who are essentially kept unemployed artificially 
uh, artificially in the sense that, you know, if they wanted to give them jobs, they could just create a federal jobs guarantee like many social democracies do or uh, quote unquote actually existing socialist countries did. Um, it's very easy to, you know, unemployment is always a choice. And this is why the MMT people, the modern monetary theory, they're always kind of confused at why unemployment is allowed. They always say, well, we can just give them jobs. Why do we have unemployment? They tend to look at um, almost like our policymakers as if they're just dumb or something. And then Marxists will say, no, uh, this is by design. This is a part of capitalism. The state, which is, you know, a capitalist institution, whether the um, politicians, you know, acting in the state, the drivers in front of the steering wheel might not be aware of it or not. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, the state operates in the capitalist interest by creating laws. And in the case of certain institutions like the Federal Reserve, through interest rates, you know, they have the NERU, the uh, natural rate of unemployment, they call it. So they raise or lower interest rates to maintain what they think is a healthy level of unemployment, which is um, which is insane because, you know, there's no healthy rate of unemployment other than zero. Yes, but a healthy level of poison. <laughs> yeah, a healthy level of homelessness. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's by design to have this because this gives capitalists more leverage so that they can pay people less and so that they can not, uh, they can fire people easily and people can't, you know, unionize as easily because let's say you did have a full employment economy, which we've had, we have examples to turn to, let's say, you know, after World War II, uh, strikes were very common. And this was a complaint that capitalists had in the 1960s. If you wanted to quit your job, you could and get another job a lot more, way more easily than, than you could now. And this is something that capitalists really don't like. So they would prefer a situation in which workers have to compete for jobs rather than employers have to compete for workers. So this is a power relationship in and of itself to maintain, um, well, maybe more explicitly profit, but there is the, um, the sort of implication there with the, with the Marxist theory of the reserve army of labor that capitalists will maintain this power relationship over employees. In what way does cast, is cast different from this? Well, I, th I think that there's a great agreement uh, between cast and Marxists on on this uh, issue. You know, it, 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 essentially, you know, I, I I agree with everything that you said. Um, the where cast differs from the Marxist perspective here is that cast puts the emphasis on the other side. So. On, on essentially, you know, all, all of the issues as well. So, you know, the, the labor theory of value uh, would say that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's surplus labor extraction. That's where profits are coming from. So labor is value. Stop having your labor be stolen. Um, whereas on the cash side, instead, it says, you know, profit is exploitation. Profit is, you know, forced through power, all profits are immoral. So instead of you know saying take back your labor, we're saying stop profit, um, which kind of has the same effect, um, but you know and leads to the same revolutionary implications just from the other way. And it's like that here with uh, unemployment too, you know where the Marxists have the reserve army of labor, and and instead of uh, you know, Casp doesn't. Uh, Casp agrees completely with uh, the existence of that phenomenon, but it comes at it from the other direction. Instead of saying that the capitalists maintain a reserve army of labor, instead it says that capitalists remain a constant level of sabotage and artificial scarcity. So, you know, in, instead of saying you know capitalists intentionally maintain uh, a bunch of you know a, a, an army of unemployed. Instead, they say capitalists intentionally maintain scarcity, um, which leads to an army of unemployed. But it puts the emphasis on the other foot. Uh, it puts it on scarcity instead of uh, unemployment itself. So this brings us sort of to the question, um, which is sort of maybe to pull it back a little bit. Um, because often with political economy, while I get super interested in this, I have a pretty diverse listener base of some people who come for the th more critical theory philosophy. Some people come for the economy. Some people who come just for the politics. Some people who come from the stupid humor. So it's really uh, sometimes I got to pull it back a little bit. Um, and, and I can provide the stupid. You can provide the humor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
what do capitalists want? I mean, the the big question, you know, for, um, it's, the the question they'll say, what do men want? What do women want? What do capitalists want? And I, I and for Marxists, this is this is this is just a kind of way to pull back and. Maybe it's still relevant to the topic, but you know, for Marx, as this would be obviously profits. If you, capitalists want to increase their capital, capital accumulation is the goal. Um, for neoclassical economics, we'll say it's to increase utility, which is you know very similar in many ways to the Marxist framework, but except much more subjective because they'll say, oh, utility is subjective and stuff like that. Um, for Casps, obviously, is anyone can, who's been paying attention. Capitalists want power, but what does this really mean? And is this relative? Some people would say, how useful is this as a framework? Because can we even quantify power? Question yeah, so, for the listener base. Yeah, uh, at its core, one dime, I think capitalists just want to be loved. Uh, but <laughs> more, more than that, <laughs> uh, on, just want- on a, they, they just they, want they just, they, they just need a daddy. They just need a mommy. Yeah, you know, they, Freud just... was right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, aside from the uh, emotional damage that leads one to become an exploitative billionaire, uh, capitalists want power, and power is relative. So, as, as you're saying, uh, the neoclassicals and the Marxists would both kind of uh, agree that profit is the goal. But when we look at how capitalists act, and I think this is a very, very important point uh, too, when we look at how capitalists act and what matters and what is important to capitalists, um, we see that profits are important. Capitalization is important. It's not about uh, making money relative to the money that you spend. It's about increasing your capitalization, your stock market value relative to other corporations' stock market values. And I think there's you know inc- an incredible dearth of examples on this uh, right now, um, where we have uh, Uber, you know, uh, a- as a uh, a, a massive, hugely capitalized, you know, uh, multinational corporation that's never made any money, you know, in, I think it's 15, 20 years of operation, closer to 15, I think. Uh, they, they're they capitalized, you know, I think, oh, you know, close to a trillion dollars. i will got to see what Uber's market cap is. Uh, just to correct myself, Uber has a uh, market cap of sixty-four point nine six uh, billion dollars, which is much less than a trillion. Tesla has a, a market cap of around a trillion. They're also an example of this. Yeah, so Uber doesn't make profits, um, and Tesla, for the most part, also doesn't make profits. If you look at where Tesla's uh, so-called profits come from, it's all through energy credits uh, through the the federal government. They don't make money by selling cars. They make money through the state. Um, but you know, Uber, Lyft, Tesla, Amazon as well. Amazon's uh, retail business is notoriously unprofitable. They essentially subsidize the whole shipping and uh, online ordering and warehousing uh, business with their web services, which are profitable. And you ask yourself, you know, why are these corporations doing activities and engaging in large scale industrial production? When it is very, you know, demonstrably unprofitable to do so, they're losing money, and the answer is they're not out to make profit. They're out to increase their capitalization, to increase their stock market value. Um, Isn't that for the long term goal of getting more profit? Like they they want a monopoly, right? So that then they can jack up prices and get away with it, and lower labor costs. That's so that the- they can make more profit. It's like a long-termist approach, is that not? Because you can see to a certain extent, Amazon, right, wasn't making profit for a long time. Now they are. Um, or Netflix, right? Netflix drove out all its competition by providing things at very low cost, borrowing a lot of money, uh, making no profits for a long time. It drove out Blockbuster, drove out all the video stores, and now it's jacking up prices. Now it's starting to make profits. So is it still not just for profits? Yes, that's the justification that gets thrown around. But if we look at the functioning of these corporations, you know, uh, in in the real world, we see that that's not true. Um, Where, 
if you number one, if you uh, jack your prices up, you're going to lose uh, your customers, uh, especially as a lot of these uh, monopolies aren't monopolies on essential goods. Um, but that's a that's a different story. Um, the reason why the corporations that aren't profitable aren't just doing it for future expectations is because they're not making moves to ever price gouge at the monopoly level. You know, like Amazon. I, I actually have a, a, a guy who used to work uh, for uh, Amazon corporate with me at the new school. Uh, and, you know, he, he'd he be the first to tell you, uh, Amazon was never uh, trying to uh, increase its uh, prices on, you know, its online order service. Um because it has a monopoly on it because they recognize that if we jack prices up to like $16 for a pair of socks, uh, then people are going to go nuts. You know, there's going to be a lot of resistance to that politically and economically. Uh, so what we have to do is keep prices just at a level that, you know, isn't going to invite resistance, but is at a level that we can continue operations. Uh, and because you know the warehousing uh, industry is so unprofitable and thin margin, Amazon really never makes any money on it. So the goal is not to make any profit. The goal is to take up space, to have power and to maintain power, which is interestingly the same dynamic as the feudal lords uh before capitalism as well which is what i one of the things i find so compelling about casp is that it's it describes capitalism not as a mode of production but as a mode of power uh and i think that that gives us both a, a better historical perspective a better empirical perspective and a better perspective on what praxis we should do to combat it What's interesting is because one picture we can find, we can get from our discussion and also from the video I referenced, which, you know, I really recommend <laughs> that people watch is if growth isn't really what capitalists are after, is growth actually the problem here? Because, you know, we have the degrowth movement, right, which is getting very popular in left wing progressive circles which is that we need negative growth rates, or at the very least, you need 0% growth rates. Uh, we need to descale the economy. We need to grow less because the idea is that uh, economic growth is creating, um, is, is the reason why for environmental destruction. And you know, to a certain extent, this is not entirely untrue. I mean, if we look at, for example, like the automobile industry and its incentives to maximize profits, there is the incentive of planned obsolescence uh, where the companies will deliberately create vehicles that do not last as long, uh, but that they can sell much more frequently so that they can yield higher profits. We see this too with Apple, you know, making a new iPhone every year and deliberately it, it, there's total proof that they're, they do have planned obsolescence so that their products don't last as long as they could. Um, so like there's this general idea that, you know, growth and this drive for constant profit is the problem and we need to do scale. Would, wouldn't CASP problematize this notion that economic growth is a problem? And how would it reconcile itself with the degrowth movement? Yeah, CASP uh, doesn't really vibe well with the degrowth movement although you know cast would recognize that yeah you know uh growth is kind of destroying the planet you know in a, a very real sense considering that oil is the 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 blood of the industrial system and the more the industrial system operates the more oil we're going to burn the more oil we burn the worse global warming gets um, until we move to a post-carbon economy and eh, that doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon uh, so, yeah, we agree with that. But the problem with degrowth is that capitalists don't want growth in the first place, is the argument from CASP. So yeah, because growth is conflictual, uh, growth uh, creates opportunities for uh, usurpation. So think about how Yahoo was uh, the the primary, you know, far and away, the lead search engine, and then Google came up and, you know, kicked it down. That was a consequence of growth where, you know, to the owners of Yahoo, you know, it they, they would not want 
uh, economic growth or you know growth within the tech industry because that's potential competition uh, and competition that could usurp them as a capital entity and did. Um, so to the degrowth movement, CASP uh, c- kind of casts a little bit of a, a shady eye in saying, yeah, you're right on environmental terms, and we should you know, certainly limit certain industrial activities so that we don't kill the planet. But overall, you might just be playing into the capitalist hands because they don't want growth in the first place. Just like the kings of old, they want to maintain a present predictable power structure. One thing that definitely made me convinced, at least by what I understand to be the CASP hypothesis, that capitalists don't really want economic growth. That's not really the natural capitalist mode of production is not this hyper growth economy. Uh, Stagnation actually is its natural state. And what convinces me of this are, are really many things. But one thing is that the reluctance to invest in clean energy both from the standpoint of private capital, which you could rationalize from a Marxist perspective in that, you know, the the reason why private capitalists don't invest in clean energy is because of profit, Uh, because it doesn't yield short-term profit. Actually, for example, like solar and wind are apparently so cheap that they don't yield such big profits like oil does. So there isn't an incentive to get into it. But from the standpoint of the capitalist state, if you want to increase the growth of your economy, you would invest in something like clean energy. There's so much jobs to be had, you know, so much new industry to be had. There's always this complaint that, you know, the economy is dying and that jobs are being shipped. Okay, we'll create new industry. How come they don't do that? And, you know, possibly because this would, if I, if I were to maybe put my cast pad on, maybe this is because it's it a very would sexy hat. It, I love it. It, <laughs> it would threaten the power. Of, of a lot of capitalists. Like, for instance, it would threaten the power of people who have hold monopoly on oil. Could Absolutely. that be a way to explain it? So, and also an- another thing that is, I think the, that Cas does have a good explanation to is why austerity politics is even a thing. Because, you know, uh, there's this problem with, we know austerity politics, even if, if someone studies like Keynesian economics, but even more if they study MMT, that austerity is total horseshit. You know, the idea that balancing the budget is a good thing for the economy um, or that um, cutting social programs, cutting social spending is good for the economy. It's actually the opposite, right? When you have a a smaller budget deficit and a budget surplus, you're just deleting more money out of the system. And you're basically leaving a private sector deficit. More Less public debt equals more private debt, less private surpluses. Uh, and less profits, right? So in in every way possible, it doesn't make any sense. Actually, every time to balance the budget has played in many ways to like stagnation. Like for example, Bill Clinton balancing the budget in 1999, um, many economists, especially on the MMT end, have argued that this played a role in actually creating a stagnation afterwards. And some even argue played a role in the financial crisis. Um, And you know, with Reagan too, you see Reagan raised interest rates uh, during hyperinflation and it didn't actually stop hyperinflation. It actually prolonged hyperinflation and absolutely decimated incomes and decimated growth. So you see these policies clearly don't create a good economy from like a quote unquote objective, if there is such a thing, objective economic analysis. You know, if you're talking about good economy by growth, medium, median incomes, levels of inequality, Austerity politics are not really good for anyone other than maybe like the top capitalists. They're not even good for the small capitalists. High interest rates decimate small businesses. Um, also, you know, smaller shares of incomes makes it uh, harder for small businesses to profit without raising prices, which is not something they can do so easily, you know, without losing market share, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you explain this? Either if you look at it from a purely modern monetary theory you can say the people in charge and power just don't understand it. They're genuinely stupid. You know, economists like Warren Mosler kind of talk like this implicitly. They kind of say, they almost like assume that like uh, the people in power are kind of just dumb. And Stephanie Kelton in her book, The Deficit Myth, talks about how she talked to many politicians and most of them either don't understand how modern money works at all. And they're genu- genuinely convinced um, by how this 
they're genuinely convinced by like, this is how things are supposed to work or they do understand it, but are afraid to push back on it because the public is so brainwashed. But if we look at it with the CASP mindset, this is actually how capitalism is supposed to work in the sense that, you know, when you have these austerity politics, you may crush the whole economy, but in doing so you crush labor and you crush not only labor, but you also crush small business, which creates a higher differential power for the top capitalists. It gives the top capitalists ever more power. Yeah. Which, uh, oh, go ahead. I mean, does that make sense? Like, am, am totally. I getting it? Totally. I, I think that there's two things separately that you're getting at. One is, is the differential stuff, and two is the uh, sabotage and protection stuff. So, so firstly, uh, you're, you're totally getting it in that capitalism's operators act like they're Mad Max. You know, the goal isn't to create as much growth and pop and profit as possible. The goal is the goal is to be the king of the wasteland. Uh, you know, I think a, a wonderful real world example of this is J.P. Morgan uh, in the 2008 uh, financial crisis, uh, where you know banks were falling off a cliff. Uh, you know, when uh, the the subprime uh, crisis uh, imploded, and J.P. Morgan, uh, you know, all, all the bank stocks and their capitalization fell through the floor. And uh, J.P. Morgan fell precipitously uh, because investors uh, and, and the market expected J.P. Morgan to have very, very large exposure to subprime mortgages. And then when, uh, you know, their, their books came out and you know, it, it turned out actually their exposure was relatively low. It was a lot lower than a lot of the other banks. Their stock market uh, capitalization went up, you know, and that's in an environment where profits across the industry are falling, expected to fall, and the entire thing is blowing up. And JP Morgan's stock price went up. And that's because the goal is to succeed relative to your competitors, not on an objective basis. So JP Morgan was Mad Max. The entire banking industry was on fire, and yet they were the kings of the wasteland, and they won out in terms of stock in terms of stock market price. And now they're uh, the largest bank in America. Um, and then I think the second thing that you were uh, touching on was, uh, you know, are, are the people in power stupid? Uh, Verse, you know, uh, or why aren't we switching to green energy when we're all going to die if we don't? Uh, and I've got a Two, two comments on that. No, number one is I think the best illustration of the, the functioning of capitalism it was given, uh, was unironically demonstrated by, uh, accidentally by Ben Shapiro, uh, because the guy is such an idiot. Uh, he, there's this famous clip that I think H bomber guy, uh, uh, use this uh, YouTube video essayist uh, from England, uh, and and he the the clip was Ben Shapiro talking about you know uh, global warming, and he goes, "What you think that if people's houses, uh, you know, uh, get sunk underwater due to rising sea levels, that the people that own those houses won't just sell them and move?" And then H bomber guy comes in, he's like, "Sell them to who, Ben? Aquaman?" And, oh yeah that's a classic yeah 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 yeah. and yeah. and i i think that's a wonderful illustration of why we haven't switched to green energy and why we won't switch to green energy under capitalism uh because uh you know exxon Mobil and you know saudi ramco the entire petroleum and and auto and crude oil industry um who's going to buy those assets you know, if if we start switching to green energy, not only are, are they going to not make any profit anymore, but also their capitalization, the, the pseudo quantified value of the power that they have over society is going to collapse because no one's going to need oil infrastructure and oil wells anymore if we don't use oil. So they need us to need you know, capitalists need to manufacture and maintain that need, you know, which is why America's rail infrastructure got bought out uh, in the 1970s uh, by 
uh, a consortium of uh, car and uh, oil and tire companies. And this was ruled in the Supreme Court case, uh, United States versus uh, National City Lines Incorporated, and I believe 1973, where the outcome was the Supreme Court ruled, yes, uh, all of the major auto manufacturers and tire manufacturers and oil manufacturers of the U.S. colluded to buy up the U.S.'s uh, uh, light rail infrastructure intentionally destroy it and tear up the track so it couldn't come back uh, and then uh, replace it with buses, which consumed more gas and more tires and were more inefficient. Uh, and they did so for profit. And the U.S. Supreme Court fined them $1.00. And because it was an antitrust case, they find the fines were tripled. So they all had to pay $3, you know, oh, oh, the whoa, I don't know how they'll be able to afford it, but they need us to need. And, and just to conclude that, where point, will we get the money? <laughs> where would we get the money? Maybe from the profits we made from forcing everyone to buy our gas and drive cars. Oh my God. Where do but, U.S. dollars come from? They they uh, they come from. Um, I can't answer that question because then austerity politics doesn't make sense. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, and and just to conclude this uh, thought on uh, in environmentalism, I'd like to read a quick passage from uh, Cass where uh, Nitzan and Bickler uh, address it directly. Uh, they they say on uh, page. 233 and 234 of uh, Capital is Power, um, the idea that profit maximization necessitates cost minimization and that cost minimization requires efficient production holds only in the fairy tale of perfectly competitive equilibrium. In this fictitious context where prices and wages are set by mother market to, equi to equilibrate marginal pr productivity and utility, it certainly makes sense for the representative capitalist to adopt the most efficient techniques. But once we get rid of the friction and move to the real world where prices represent not utility and productivity, but power, these imperatives immediately break down on their own terms. Productive efficiency no longer implies economic efficiency, and economic efficiency no longer means maximum profit. Let's illustrate this principle with more contemporary examples. Take transportation. On the face of it, a well-designed public transit seems much more conducive to human welfare and the natural environment than private transit. Yet in the U.S. and elsewhere, capitalist transportation has tended to move away from the public and towards the private. And the reason is not hard to grasp. Public transportation resonates with the integrated operation of industry and therefore doesn't sit well with the regular flow of business profit. This is perhaps the reason why early in the 20th century, the automobile companies bought and dismantled 100 electric railway systems in 45 U.S. cities. And it is also why these companies have long shunned any radical change in energy sources. The electric car, first invented in the 1830s, predates its gasoline and diesel counterparts by a half century and for a while was more popular. But by the early 20th century, having proved less profitable than the gas guzzlers, it fell out of favor and was forcefully erased from the collective memory. Then came intolerable pollution, which in the 1990s led the state of California to mandate a gradual transition of automobiles to alternative energy. Complying with the new regulations, General Motors had its engineers quickly develop a highly efficient electric car, the EV1. But fearing that this gem of a car would undermine profit from their gas guzzlers, the company's owners, along with the owners of other concerned corporations in the automotive and oil business, also invested in an orchestrated attempt to defeat the California bill. When the regulation was finally overturned, every specimen of the EV1 was recalled and literally shredded. And that's your prime example of productive efficiency and profit not being the goal of capitalism. It's profit is sabotage. Profit is power. Capitalists need people to need. So they made sure that we had to consume gas and we had to get around in cars. And when even the prospect of switching to an electric car uh, you know, it came onto the horizon, they defeated the bill that provided that prospect of future change. And then they took back every electric car they made and shredded it to make sure that we would continue to need them power so you know with this talk of power um being the dominant emphasis of casp as opposed to merely profit and capital accumulation doesn't any way casp overlap a little bit with the theories of michel foucault who puts a big emphasis on power as opposed to profit accumulation you know foucault famous critical theorists 
um, is in any way uh, he studied by Nitzan? Yeah, uh, and Nitzan and Bikur have a little bit of a disdain for the postmodernists because they don't see them as proposing anything. So well, I do too, but yeah. I, 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 have, I have issue with post. Well, I don't know. I guess postmodernism to me, I don't really think postmodernism is a thing. Like I think postmodernity is a thing, but if like we are going to call these philosophers like postmodern, yeah, I know what they mean. Like I, I hate that. To be honest, I feel that way about all the French intellectuals <laughs> is they don't propose very much of anything, but they sometimes have useful theories for understanding dynamics like you know, Foucault maybe for understanding power, Boudriard for understanding reality and simulation. Um, what what is yeah? What is uh, Nitzan's relationship with people like Foucault? I I think that uh, Nitzan would largely a- agree with Foucault's idea of societies of control and, and uh, societies based on uh, punishment and observation. But I, I think that Nitzan would critique uh Foucault in saying okay now what you know like congrats you have correctly diagnosed that we live in a society of control um what's your theory on how to resist and you know he'd say capital is power is the way forward Hmm. so now this ties me into the last two questions um I guess in what way does capitalist power tie into anarchism? Because you yourself, you said you identify as an anarchist, right? Uh, yes, sir. No laws, no gods, no masters. Nice. And no bedtime. So, so in what way does CASP tie into a- anarchism? So CASP is really on, on a weird place in, in the... Uh, in the contemporary uh, political milieu where it's turning anarchists into, I, I, I really don't want to use this term because all of my, uh, uh, so I won't say the word Vanguard then um, it, it's it, okay. It's, you can, Take the Lenin pill. <laughs> it, it, it's basically taking anarchists and saying, how would we, you know, create a social machine that sort of looks like an economic version of a revolutionary party? And it, it, it's really weird. Um, I am an anarchist and I would not advocate for uh, a vanguard party, despite you know, the many people that hurl uh, the the phrase anarcho-Leninist at me is like a, a derogatory term. And I don't know. know. I'm an anarcho-Stalinist. <laughs> Stalin, I, Stalin built the first anarchist society. I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I, honestly, uh, I, I'd say that uh, I'd be an anarcho-Clintonist where the more saxophone you play on TV and Yeltsin's you install in Russia, the more anarchy you are. An- uh, Anarcho-Bidenism is the turn right now. <laughs> an- 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 Anarcho-Bidenism is when you vote Democrat, you support NATO on everything. And yeah, um, it's anarchist because it's against the tankies. So if it's against the tankies, and as long as it's it's pro-NATO, so as anarchists, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But to, to, to try to express where caste intersects with anarchism is that it's a third position. It is expressly anti-neoclassical. Oh, no, it, third position. It's, it's, not, it's not third position-ist. No. Yeah. Uh, but you, don't mix, mix, you don't want to make, mix it up with the, the fascists. Absolutely not, Jesus. Uh, but it, it, it's anti-neoclassical and it's anti-marxist uh on empirical grounds uh on empirical it, grounds emphasize yes. that because marxists are going to hear that they're going to be so angry anti-marxist yeah. if you're anti-communist you so you're like you you're telling me you're you're uh you're a fascist uh no. <laughs> social no. fascist that's, that's what they're gonna call no. it I, I mean i so empirical grounds be clear about that because i also yes. disagree with marxists about like some empirical things like for example like Marx had no idea about money. 
Okay. That's just yeah, true. Cash. Like he thought money came from barter and uh, that's wrong. So, uh, yeah. but I, I, I still like the, I still would identify a bit with like the Marxist political project, but uh, that's separate from like maybe, I, I, I think frankly, believing in anything like, everything that one school of thought says completely and that's it is always kind of stupid and it's basically yeah. religion at that point yeah but yeah it's another that's another story yeah so so casp uh it, it it intersects with anarchism in that anarchists have been very very receptive to its ideas and are ready to essentially create a new ideology uh, out of it, which I'm currently attempting to do. I'm uh, writing a book right now. Uh, working title is Blueprints for Anarchy, and I'm hoping to, you know, found or pioneer uh, what I would call anarcho mechanism, which is the construction of a competing social machine to capitalism, a competing economic machine, uh, and, and that vibes really well with anarchists because it's essentially dual power. Um, and it also, I think, this is the weird thing, it also vibes really well with uh, some of the Marxists uh, that I've engaged with. You know, uh, uh, shout out Mel um, at A World to Win, uh, where essentially Casp doesn't engage very much with uh, historical materialism and just is very pragmatic about an approach to economic data and says, okay, a labor theory value can't predict long-term price movements like this. It can't predict long-term movements and capitalization like this. What can? It doesn't get into dialectics essentially at all. Uh, you know, so it's, it's very, I would say it, it, yeah. it does, from my impression, it does seem to actually be very historical material. It's just not very dialectical. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it could, you could look at it as dialectical because let's say we're looking at it in terms of contradiction. It is a contradiction in itself. Like the fact to even notice something like the discrepancy between economic growth and asset price values or economic growth and differential power, that's a contradiction in itself. The idea that uh, as the economy grows, capitalists actually prefer the opposite. They prefer it grows, it's stagnant, that's a contradiction. And to even spot that requires some level of level of dialectical thinking, um, even if one is not consciously adopting the Hegelian glasses. Yeah, although I, I'd say that that's getting a little too, uh, too much into the weeds. I'm an anarchist and uh, whenever I, I get too much into the materialist dialectics, I start getting a rash and I uh, start uh, <laughs> chanting to myself, Malatesta, Malatesta. Uh, but no, I, I, I think that, uh, the reason why Cass or, 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 or Cass really does, uh, represent a wonderful opportunity to bring together the black and the red again, um, in that you can tell the Marxists, you can have your dialectics, you tell the anarchists, you know, this is all about combating power in its main incarnation. Um, and then you build dual power to one day usurp the productive capacity of capitalism. Um, so I am an anarchist. Uh, and I, I am an anarchist. Yeah. I am an <laughs> antichrist. Uh, I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I do pose myself against Marxist Leninist practice. Um, but I think that this is a really great opportunity for Marxists and anarchists to work together on a very pragmatic, productive, dual power machine to oppose capitalism. You and know, that's I agree. why some, yeah, and that, that's why some anarchists don't like me because you're like, you would work with tankies, and I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to overthrow capital. Come on, you know, like a like a, I would agree, like a like a good Bukharanist, I am that I am. Um, I agree with that. We should uh, um, work with the anarchists as long as they don't blow us up in terrorist attacks. That's fine. Uh, I don't hey, as long should... as you don't do Kronstadt again, we're cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no more. No Kronstadt. I'm not a Trotskyist. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I agree. Anyways, this has been a really interesting podcast. I think I got to mostly all the questions I had, but obviously, in order to truly explore CASP, I got to read the full book, Capital as Power. Uh, which I will do at some point. It's a very menacing task, to be honest. Too many graphs, too many lines. Whenever I see graphs, I'm going to be honest, 
too many graphs and lines. It just, oh, it makes me dizzy. Just me. It's why it's it's ultimately why I study political science instead of economics, even though I really like political economy. But uh, as daunting as it seems, it's something I will have to get into, and it's a theory that is compelling. And I think, um, you know, while you do while you do a synthesis between anarchism and caste, for me, my sort of thin synthesis that I've been working on is MMT and Marxism, and perhaps caste could complement that to a certain extent. So we'll see what I find out and what I come to in my journey studying this. It's been great, though, having you explain this all to me and to the audience. I hope you have all gotten a lot out of it. If you enjoyed the podcast, consider supporting on Patreon, where you get tons of exclusive podcasts. There's over 12 episodes now on, probably more as we're talking about this. So if you want to get access to that to learn some shit, become a patron. What are you doing? Don't do it. Bye-bye.